Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September 10th Oklahoma City Planning Commission meeting. If you have pagers, cell phones, or similar devices, we would ask that you would either turn those off or silence them now, please. And if you are not the applicant and you've come here to talk about a case today, we have sign-up sheets like these. They're on the table right outside the chambers. And if you'd fill one out, we would be happy to hear you when the item is heard. First item is uh, approval of the August 27th minutes. And I'll note the three members who are listed as having been present were absent that day. And that's Mike Hensley, Lee Cooper, and myself. So we will not voting on that item. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd vote we accept the minutes. There is one correction on the front page. It shows that all nine members were present. Uh, the detail does not reflect Correct. that. So uh, with that one change, uh, I'd move the minutes. OK, commissioners, cast your votes. And that minutes are approved. Thank you. Uh, continuance requests. We have nine uncontested requests for continuance. I'm going to read those off. Uh, it would be item B18 on your agenda for item SPUD 833. It's actually been withdrawn. Item B19 is PUD 1591. That's being continued to September 24th. Item B20, C 6739, deferred to September 24th. Item B21, which is PUD 1593. Continue that to September 24th. Item B22, which is C6747, also to September 24th. Item B23, which is case PC10425, to continue to September 24th. Item B24, which is case PC104429, defer that one to October 8th. Item B25, which is case PUD 1594 to defer to October 8th. And item B26, which is case C6748 to defer to October 8th. I understand that one person came to talk to us on item 26. Has anyone else come to talk to us about these cases today that were just read, items 18 through 26 on our agenda? Okay, Ms. Stevens, we'll hear from you on item 26. If you'd come forward, please. G give us your name and address, please. My name is Eileen Stevens. My address is 3735 Janet Circle, Mustang, Oklahoma. Okay, thank you. I came to speak on behalf of the Pioneer Estates neighborhood, which is directly uh, west of the plan for montage. Can you okay. go ahead and say what I want? Pardon me? You want me to go ahead and speak? Uh, go right ahead. You understand it's going to be continued today? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're going to, um, I'll come back on October 8th since it's been deferred, but I've given you each a handout. So we basically had a list of concerns, and I spoke to Mr. Tull. Uh, briefly, he went over some of those, the engineer for the plat. Um, so we just wanted to list our concerns and just attend and be present as this uh, plat is uh, reviewed by the commission. Okay. We will see you on the 8th of October then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We Anyone also, else? Sorry. Okay, commissioners, need a motion and a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uncontested requests as read. Cast your votes. And those are continued. Thank you. There are three new requests for continuance for item A3, which is case C6750 to defer that to September 24th. Item B12, which is SPUD 848, to defer to September 24th, and item B13, which is CE 919, to defer to October 8th. Same question as before. Did anyone come today to address us on items 3, 12, or 13 on our agenda? Okay. Move the new request. Second the motion. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve the additional continuances. Cast your votes. They are approved. Are there any continuous requests from the public today? Okay, we'll go to the consent docket. There are four items on consent. Uh, one had just recently been removed. So I, I will read items one, two, four, and five 
on the agenda. First item is C6744, the final plat of Fieldstone, Section 4. The second item is C6749, the final plat of Still Meadows Commercial Park. Item 4 is the final plat of Hefner Woods Office Park. And item 5 is case C6753, the final plat of Ashton Cove. Anyone here to address us on any of the items in the consent docket? Items 1, 2, 4, or 5? Move the consent. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Less item three, cast your votes, and that's approved. Under items requiring separate vote, the first case is item six for SPUD 844 to rezone 100 East California Avenue from the BC district to SPUD 844. Is the applicant here? Justin Owen, 23737, 240 Street, Purcell, Oklahoma, and I'm here today representing Verizon Wireless. I want to thank the commission for taking the time to hear this case. I know Verizon's really excited to get these sites on air and improve the voice and data service available in the Bricktown area. This is the third of three uh, of the small cells that will be going in front of the, the commission. The other two were passed in July. This one is very similar to the previous one. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioners, anyone? Uh, Bricktown did approve this item. Uh, has, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to know, has this also gone before the Bricktown Design Committee? Yes, that's yes. what I've, yeah, Bricktown Design Committee has approved it. Okay. All right. Any other questions, discussion? Motion? Move for adoption. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item six, cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank you. Thank you. The, the only question I have about this is when we'll know whether these, this um, pilot program has been successful. And are you going to come back and tell us? Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's something uh, we could come back and get back to you on. I don't have that information right here. Are we thinking right about here. months or years? or? Uh, yeah, I would think, uh, I understand this is a, a one-year initial design program. I don't know if it will be extended beyond that or not. So sometime around next July, we'll know one way or the other, huh? I would think so. Okay. Item 7 is SCE 920 to close a portion of Northwest 27th Street and its alley between North Blackwelder Avenue and North Florida Avenue. Is the applicant here? Give us your name and address for the record, please. Greg Kerskeeter. I'm the Associate Athletic Director at Oklahoma City University, uh, which is 2501 North Blackwelder Avenue, 73106. Okay. Uh, strictly here in case the Commission had any uh, questions for us. I have questions. Um, does OCU own all of this property? We do. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? No one signed up. Nick? Well, we're, we're doing this to accommodate the soccer field. Correct. But we've already, we've been playing soccer there for a while. <laughs> yes, sir. Actually, the, the area in question is contained within the soccer field. We've had two previous um, applications for building permits that were granted that fall within the right of way. And when we came back for one to add a soccer locker room complex, they said, well, that's in the right of way. You actually shouldn't have these two others, so that's why we're requesting a oh, vacation. Yeah, we're cleaning up. I assume there's no one signed up. No one signed up. Move approval. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve item seven. Cast your votes, and it's approved. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Item eight is CE 912 to close a portion of Northwest 12th Street at the BNSF Railroad Crossing, one block east of North Broadway Drive. And the applicant. Brian Haskins, do you happen to be watching this in the back room? I 
hope so, because I was thinking it would be beneficial to have a little bit of background on, you know, he what we're in, doing and why here. He was in the pre-meeting. Since so there's a cluster of them. Brian, we'll need your name for the record. Uh, Brian Haskins, representing staff, City of Oklahoma City. Okay, we're on items eight, nine, and ten. Okay. In order. All right. Yes, we're actually proposing uh, permanently closing these these uh, four intersections as far as the quiet zone project. Uh, any questions? Janice has one, I'm sure. Uh, the reason we're closing the uh, intersections is because we get credits from the FRA to create a quiet zone. And um, so when we close them, we get credits. And we have to have so many credits before you um, create a quiet zone. And um, if, um, if we have a quiet zone, that means a train doesn't have to blow their, their whistles as they go through this corridor. So. And part of that is uh, you get more credits if you close or if you permanently close a crossing. So We're going to do this sort of one by one, I guess. Um, maybe I should hold off. But you, there is a significant amount of uh, protest to one of these applications. Are you aware of that? Say that. There's, there's a significant there's, there's a, amount a, of a, protest to one of these closings. Are you aware of that? On 14th Street, yes. And would you like to speak to that? I'm sorry? Why are we closing it? <laughs> what? On 14th Street. Mm -hmm. you have any comments on that? Uh, no, I mean, as far as the traffic counts for the entire corridor, we did a, we did a study. And um, of course, you know, when we evaluated the, the project at, at the very beginning, we, we looked at, the, of course, the, the intersection of the crossings with the lowest uh, traffic count. And uh, 14th, of course, was the lowest. And we just basically used those as the criteria. Because, like, again, like I said at the beginning, I mean, when you look at the, the quiet zone in general, you have to have so many credits to be able to turn into the FRA to be able to be able to create the quiet zone. And uh, so we, of course, are going to close the, the, the crossings that have the lowest um, traffic count. And 14th was the lowest as was uh, Park, 23rd, and um, some of the others. The 11th, which is already closed, 12th. I mean, these are the ones that had the lowest count, so obviously that's the ones that we're gonna, gonna close, so. I have a question. I'm, I'm sorry, Brian? Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, from what's the northernmost intersection that you plan to close or have closed? The 14th is the northernmost. Okay, and what is the southernmost? Uh, southwest 23rd. Are there any intersections between those two that will not be closed? Oh yeah, I mean, we will, we'll, um, 13th, 10th, um, 7th, 8th, and 9th will remain open to traffic. We're actually just gonna do some uh, median um, improvements at those crossings. Again, these are two get these credits to be able to turn into the FRA so we can create the quiet zone itself. So those, are, of course, will remain open. We're going to do, like I said, median improvements and signal improvements at those, those crossings. And will the uh, engineer have to signal at those crossings because they remain open? No, actually, a part of the, the quiet zone is that, I mean, we'll still have signalization as far as lights, flashers, gates. Of course, those, those remain. But, um, but as far as the locomotive having to blow his, his horn, that requirement will be uh, eliminated. And so basically the, the train will not have to blow its horn all the way up from, I, th I believe 63rd is the, the last crossing, the at grade crossing we have all the way down to uh, southwest, I think what was just south of 23rd. We, I mean, there, there won't be a, a whistle blown that entire corridor so that of course, creates a lot of um, opportunities to develop that particular corridor. So, 
Okay, well, let's take eight and nine, and then we'll talk about the protest on item 10. Any other discussion? Nick, did you want to ask something? Well, no, since 10 had come up, I, I do have some comments on 10. Uh, all three of these uh, obviously are consistent with the quiet zone plan that we've, we've looked at before and, and all that. Uh, I have issues with 10 because of, apparently there's an access issue, but we can take that up separate. Okay. Uh, well, let's take item 8 up then, commissioners. No one signed up on that? I'd move approval of eight. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve item eight. Cast your votes. That's approved. And item nine is CE 913 to close a portion of West Park Place located at the railroad crossing uh, one block east of North Broadway. And no one has signed up on item nine? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item nine. Cast your votes. And that's approved. Now we're at item 10, Nick. We've been provided with a good deal of correspondence back and forth uh, regarding how 14th Street would work and, and the access to 14th Street. Uh, and I'm assuming someone has signed up to, to speak on this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no one has signed up today. Really? Okay. Uh, my concern. Hold on. Pardon me? That's one. Did you? Two. Oh, oh. Fire where? I can't see but past Brian here. Did you sign up, sir? Uh, let's, pardon me? Oh, you're the applicant. Is that what you're saying? On 10? Okay. We're on item 10. We're discussing the crossing at, at 14th Street. Okay. Okay. You want to come forward then, please? The I'm applicant Mike is Jackson. the applicant is the city. Say? Say the applicant is the city. Okay. Do I need to sit down now? You're a protester. I'm That's a fine. Well, we're, we're, I'm just so clarifying rules here. Okay. Uh, give us your name and address, please. Mike Jackson at 5 Northeast 14th Street, Oklahoma City, 73104. Okay. Tell us your concerns, please. Uh, concern is the closing, uh, access to the properties. There's uh, at least two businesses, if not three, that I've stated on the protest that we don't do re retail, but uh, we do have customers that come by. Uh, the problem is um, access from Broadway to our businesses on the other side of the tracks. Um, I've noticed in the past when I had to call in on uh, problems with vagrants that even the police and fire have an issue of uh, getting to the property. Uh, one of the engineers turned Oklahoma Avenue into a, decided to go ahead and apply a, a two-way instead of a one-way, which Oklahoma Avenue used to be. Uh, thinking that would make it easier for uh, our businesses to get along with the closing, and not really. Uh, uh, last time I had to call the police, uh, they had to park on the other side of the tracks because apparently their uh, information on their computers and their cars uh, haven't got it marked as a closed crossing yet, which I can understand. Um, the lights, I've heard uh, that the lights and the signals will still be working when it's closed. Well, the railroad has already pulled out the lights. I'm not sure if they're putting new ones in, but I think that was kind of a waste if they're still going to use the lights. Uh, the business next to me, which uh, the gentleman owns the building next to me, Bob Morrison, um, has loading docks that uses semis to unload equipment. Well, semi can't back into there anymore. The building basically is has lost value, and and uh, basically he can't uh, use it as storage or any kind of a heavy truck delivery. Uh, you know, we're kind of I 
I've been there about 15 years, and the crossing was was very useful. Even though we don't have we don't get much traffic there, it's just uh, uh, it's 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 not going to be useful for us. And I don't know. It's it seems like it's a lost cause for more for Bob Morrison, which owns a building next to me, than it is for me. But uh, you know, he's probably hurt a lot more than I am. And he's part of my protest and my paperwork. Okay. Uh, Nick, you want to well, clarify for me the, the semi-access or lack of semi-access there? Uh, if, they, if this is closed, is there any way to get a semi to his business? Mm, not unless you're uh, a stunt driver. <laughs> You, ha you would have to pull back, pull up past 14th, back your semi up off of Oklahoma Avenue west up 14th Street and then make another 90 into his loading docks. All and of that would be backwards? That would be backwards. And there's hardly any way to do that. Well, from reading your protest, that was the impression I had and that was my concern. Uh, it looks like we are literally denying access to property. And, and I guess my question now would be back to Public Works. What can we do to mitigate that, if anything? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian, can you respond, please? Um. As far as access, I mean, as far as turning radius, and I, I mean, I, I can't really speak to his accessibility. Um, I do know that we have other lots in the area that would um, have a similar access uh, arrangement where a truck would have to pull in. I mean, I've seen that even in our own building at 420. I can't really speak to the possibility of that. I will say this as far as on 14th Street, we have to look at the quiet zone as a continual project. And when FRA evaluates these credits that I, uh, I talked to Janice about earlier, is that you have to, all these credits are based off of closures and improvements. If we lose a crossing, if we cannot, or if we keep a crossing open, that basically effectively ends um, our application for a quiet zone, just because of how many you have to have. I mean, we're really right on the, we actually have to, we're, we're, our application is structured such that we're actually using what we call alternate safety measures because we can't have that. When you do a quiet zone, typically they want you to have like 100 foot um, median improvements. We only have room to do like 60 to 70 um, foot of, of race. So we have to look to these alternate safety measures. And one of those chiefly is closing the, the crossing itself. When we do that, we get a lot more credits. And we're really at that balance right now is if we lose another intersection, that would effectively end our, our application. Or we would have to, and, but to answer your question, I mean, how can we restructure? I mean, there is, we're very limited on our right of way on 14th Street. Um, some of the other ones like parks, we were able to acquire a little bit more to put in a, a cul-de-sac. Um, on 14th Street, as it stands right now, we do not have enough right-of-way to be able to uh, construct a cul-de-sac, a typical cul-de-sac, without limiting access to some of the, the, the other the, the adjoining properties that, that we know of, or we have to do some more acquisition. So, um, but any other questions? Well, like Commissioner Gales, I'm concerned that we're impacting somebody's business, possibly forcing them to move or putting them out of business if we close this. And I understand that we obviously want the entire quiet zone. Uh, that's a matter of city's public policy. They want to get to that point, which I agree we should try and help facilitate. Well, but can't I thought, we, go ahead, Nick. Can't we achieve credits elsewhere? Uh, or enhance the safety of this intersection and leave it open. Uh, what are our options, I guess, 
We, but, we looked at several different scenarios looking through, like I said, the entire corridor. But like I said, these are really the only at-grade crossings that we have from, from 63rd all the way south to 23rd. Um, these are the only places that are really candidates to really do the improvement. And plus, to get the credits, you have to do the improvements within the corridor that you're applying for. And um, I mean, like I said, we've looked at traffic counts. We looked at the, uh, the crossings that had the lowest traffic counts. And um, those are the ones, obviously, that we're going to close first. Well, no, I understand that. And that, that's logical. But if you are totally wiping out a business access point, uh, that's kind of an indirect taking. Uh, seems like it seems like there there needs to be some mitigation here. And I mean, this this particular crossing has been closed uh, for about two years. Uh, the railroad had to close it because of some uh, some speed limit issues that they had along that corridor. Um, so we actually temporarily closed it about two and a half years ago. And um, I mean, I don't know what kind of impact that's had as far as far as economics goes but I mean that's it has been closed for that that period of time and actually BNSF has removed some of the signals from that that uh, crossing as well so okay Mr. Now, Jackson now, come now I'm back confused. up I need to hear from Mr. Jackson yeah. again this has been closed for two years. How's this guy been getting semis to his business for the last two years? Well, you'd have to speak with Bob. He's here uh, with me, if you'd like to. Well, let's have him come up then. Okay. Let's. Give us your name and address, please. Good afternoon. Uh, Robert Morrison. Uh, I own the building at 1 Northeast 14th. And the answer to the question, we have not been receiving any tractor trailers since the closing. Uh, the, there would be a way to get them in there if you had a co-driver that could hold traffic while they backed the tractor trailer in there. Uh, we're on a leased property. We own the building, but we're on a, a, a land lease with Burlington Northern that, that specifically holds us to warehousing and, and uh, warehousing product and uh, office uh, personnel. So the fact of the matter is we have had a real hard time leasing any of the property out because of the, the limited access now. Uh, the, uh, the building was built in, I think, 34 for Nash Finch, and it has always been uh, used as warehouse. And, uh, Really, there, 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 there is pretty much no other use I can think of other than uh, storing product and, and delivering from there. At one time, we had a, a company in there that received about, oh, while we were there, eight to ten truckloads per day. And if you get a 53-foot trailer in front of a, a cab or behind a cab, you, you can't back it in. In the past, the Coca-Cola truck and all of that would come across the railroad, and then they could back right into the property looking into the left rear, uh, to their left mirror. And now, I don't, I, I don't know how you would do it. Well, we do. how have you been getting product in and out of the warehouse the last two years? Well, the, with little trucks. And, uh, and, and we haven't been able to lease it out. We had a national concern that was coming in, uh, and they, they ended up not, not uh, utilizing the space because they, they didn't have access. That's one reason that they didn't. Um, no, it, 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 it's really not a good deal for us and for the building, and I think it depreciates our value quite a bit. Thank you. And I think another thing, uh, we were not aware of the... Uh, cardinal engineering work that was done ahead of time. We were not involved in any of the meetings before then. I think we found out everything literally after they put the temporary closing up. And it, it isn't really temporary. It's, it's a barricade, permanent. You don't own the property, so the notices would not have come to you. Yeah. Well, 
Michael Jackson didn't get a notice either, and he didn't. Uh, he, he owns his property. Yeah, but in your particular case, oh, okay, would be my my suspicion. Okay, thank you, sir. Just out of curiosity, I think this is um, this one picture right here. I think shows 14th Street, or it shows the city barriers that look to be ahead of. Is that the letter? Yeah, it's a letter from Susan Morrison, right? Okay, do you see that? Pick, can take a look at that. Is that the, what it looks like right now? Uh, yes. Okay. So that those barriers, though, seem to be ahead of the railroad crossing, right? Uh, not really. That's on one side or the other. If not, I've got another picture that will give you an idea. Yeah. Of what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. So on the other side, they're closer to the crossing itself. Because this looks to be. They, they, they infringe on our, our, uh, our pad out there, our truck pad. They, they're, they're way out there. Hmm. Sure. It's okay, I'll just fold it over. I'll just look at it right quick. Oh. Yeah, that seems to be quite. If this were moved, does that help your situation? Up a little bit, but the real problem would be back, hmm? right back in there. Coming back now, this we, way. We even we lease the, the land over here to try to help, you know, where we've had it for a long time, but we thought maybe then the truck could pull back around there and pull back in, but, you know, maintain that area. We have another issue with the, the flooding and the washing away of all the gravel and the rock and everything. Hmm. Okay, thanks for the illustrating that to me. Is there anything? Well, my question was with respect of where the barriers for the street are currently located. If they were either closer to the actual railroad tracks, they seem to be set back a fairly significant way from the tracks. If they were closer to the tracks, if that alleviates some of the concerns so that you could redo that part, Still get the closing, but I don't think that that okay. appears Mike, to be the best solution. Mike, you want to say something for the fire department? Thank you. I didn't have a chance to fill out a form, but Mike Wilson with the fire marshal's office. Um, our concern was more on the west side of the tracks than it is on the east side of the tracks. We were unable to actually uh, talk with Public Works before this, but uh, they provided a uh, cul-de-sac on Park Place and a hammerhead type turnaround on um, 12th and what we would like to see on 14th is something similar to that either the the smaller I think it's like a 80 foot cul-de-sac or a t-shaped turnaround because of the depth of 14th Street on the west side of the tracks uh, because of the depth on the east side of the tracks our concern is for, as far as access for fire department vehicles and other vehicles um, because Oklahoma goes through, we didn't have as big a concern on that side. I understand the applicants' access issues for their semis. Um, but our concern only on this closing is just the west side of uh, the tracks on 14th Street. And that could be done with, you know, it may be a, a uh, issue with the work that's being done on the street improvements to do these closings. but. Uh, just that was the only one that we didn't see that was addressed. I'm going to make a suggestion here that this item be continued for a couple of weeks, that Public Works and the Fire Department talk to each other, and that you talk to the two property owners on the east side of 14th Street and see if there's anything you can do to alleviate their, their problems. Uh, because obviously, the, uh, the one business is diminished already by virtue of the barriers being there. So if you'd be willing to take a couple of weeks to do that and we could hear this item again, our first meeting in, uh, maybe the second meeting in September or the first meeting in October. Move to continue this item. Two weeks will two weeks be enough. You want to take a month? That's that's fine. I think that'll be appropriate. I don't have any problem with with the continuing. Okay. 
with two weeks or a month? Let's go ahead and probably do a month because that's going to be a lot of coordination and I guess it's time to talk to our consultant and okay. look at different alternatives. So I move that we continue this item until the first meeting in October. Okay. That's second. a motion. We have a second. We'd be really happy if you came back and everybody had some sort of a sense of a solution here. Okay. Uh, you could go make sure everybody has each other's contact details, the protesters who are here, yeah. et cetera. You may already have done that. That'd be, that would help the process so we're not looking for you. Okay, we have a motion and a second to continue item 10, cast your votes. And item 10 is continued to the first meeting in October. Item 11 is CE 915 to close a portion of Southwest 23rd Street, also at the BNSF Railroad Crossing, this one east of South Shields Boulevard. No one has signed up on this one, and I think we've heard the rationale for it. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item 11, cast your votes, and it's approved. Item 12 and 13 were deferred. Item 14 is PUD 1589 to rezone 10-101 Southwest 59th Street from AA Agricultural District to PUD 1589. Mr. Chairman, Dennis Box, members of the commission. I'm here uh, in David Box's absence. They, he and Laura had a baby son yesterday, so. The B team's here. This is a case, and uh, I'm here with Mark Grubbs. There have been several neighborhood meetings that have taken place, and this is a case with uh, an 80-acre tract, and the handout that I've given you, and I gave it to council for the uh, protestants, will kind of give you an idea about the area and, and what we're dealing with. But this is a, a piece of property that we filed a PUD, and what we wanted to do was um, have a density of all half acre tracks. Through the negotiation, we've made several amendments, and Mr. Grubbs is uh, showing you an example of the, the property in question. What's been agreed to, and we're going to agree to today, is everything that's east of the creek, as shown here, will be one acre tracks, and then everything west of the creek can be the half acre tracks. In addition to that, we have uh, agreed to the following. Three car garages. Uh, the homes will be at least 2,500 square feet. Um, the detention, we will have a detention pond. Now, when you review the staff report, it says no detention is required. That's been one of the concerns that the neighbors have had in regard to flooding. So, we're going to go ahead and put a, a detention pond. You might show them approximately where it's going to be. And um, this, this property uh, will have water, uh, will have uh, either septic or aerobic, but we'll have water to the site. And one of the requests that was made, I understand, in the homeowners meetings that we provide the water where if the neighbors back to the east wanted to hook on, they would be able to, and we agree to that. When you look at your staff report, uh, we, we believe it's in conformance with the, with the plan. Uh, we think when you look at the map that I handed out, uh, you have a hodgepodge of some larger tracks. You have some that are smaller. We're out in the uh, uh, Mustang area. Uh, we're just west of Morgan Road and 59th. We think it's a, a good tract for development. We think the compromises we've made uh, should address most of the issues that the neighbors have. And with that, is there anything you want to say? I might just add that in our, in our correspondence with the adjacent property owners, we've had three meetings or so. And we've also, um, if it was the desire of the adjacent property owners, we would improve Pleasant Hill instead of running the road inside of our property. Um, it's our understanding that, um, that there have been complaints on that road and requests to the city for improvements of that. So we, my client did agree to that. Um, it's also our understanding that some of the protesters uh, like that idea, uh, but more not than, than do like that idea. Um, also, this is the Mustang area, and south of uh, Southwest 59th, there are acre tracks, and there are quarter acre tracks down there. So um, I, know the, I know these are larger tracks over here, but the comp plan calls for higher density. Um, 
We are bringing a 20 inch main to the site and distribution through as required by the uh, city of Oklahoma City. So. And Mark, um, when you talk about those acre tracks, quarter acre tracks down in Mustang, they are served with both water and sewer? They are served with both water and sewer. We would serve with, uh, with we'll, aerobic on this due to DEQ requirements. Yeah, we'll have water, but we won't have sewer. What's that? You'll have water, but no sewer. No, we, won't, we won't be bringing sewer. Thank you. Yeah. And you're, look, you're looking at quarter acre lots? No. Half. These are half acres half. Okay. on the west side, and we've agreed to do one acre one on the acre east. On the okay. East. Just to kind of compromise the buffer. So. Okay. We have a number of people signed up. You are? My name is Larry Finn. I'm the attorney for Teresa and Brian Provine. Commissioner. My name is Larry Finn and my address, it's 1503 East Street, 9, East 19th Street, Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, I have here with me today Vincent Charla Mayer, I believe Gary Jones, and Brian and Teresa Provine. Uh, we are asking that the Commission deny the applicant's proposed PUD for a number of reasons. Uh, initially, the PUD design statement that they submitted in support of their application does not contain all the information as required by Section 59, um, Part 14150. Now, that information is important in this particular case because of the location of the proposed PUD development. The proposed PUD development is in a floodplain, but let me briefly go through what is not contained in the design statement. Uh, they do not have uh, a statement in here how the PUD complies with the policies of the Southwest Sector Plan, uh, the phases in sequence in the development of the plan, uh, or the phases and sequences in which the development is proposed to be built, a table setting the minimum and maximum to total dwelling units, a description of residential and mixed-use neighborhoods, drainage information, information describing the basic stormwater management methods, and referencing any FEMA 100-year floodplains floodways, uh, a statement of utility lines and services to be installed, including which lines will be dedicated to the city and which will remain private, and a description of trash collection facilities. Now, I understand through the staff report some of those items were addressed, but the items that were not addressed are specifically the max number of dwelling units that will be on the property. Um, now, while each reason is sufficient to deny the application, most importantly is the fact that they are proposing to put in, uh, they're not going to put in sewer, they're not going to have sewer. Uh, on a lot size less than one acre, you cannot have a septic system. The only other option they have is an aerobic treatment system. Uh, under Oklahoma, under the Oklahoma City Municipal Code that I passed out on page two, it provides that a minimum setback of 25 feet shall be maintained from the surface application area to adjoining public street, public property, or property owned by another person. In their design statement, they have that the rear and side yard setbacks will be 10 feet. That puts, that means that it would be impossible for them to dispose of the, uh, the wastewater effluent in the side or backyards, because that's only 10 feet. That puts them too close to the neighbors. Now, in the front yard, the front yard setback is 25 feet. The statute provides that, a, or the code ordinance provides, a minimum setback of 25 feet shall be maintained from the surface application area. Now, they're proposing to spray this wastewater into the air within, and the area that it will be sprayed is within 25 feet of other property owners and of public streets. Now, uh, throughout these different discussions that we've had with the developer, uh, they have brought up that, uh, they have said that sewer is too expensive to run, that they don't want to, uh, that they cannot afford to run sewer to the, to the proposed location of the PUD. Now, the problem that we have with that statement is that they are building in our backyard. We're not building in theirs. They have a duty and an obligation to make sure that their use, their proposed use, complies not only with the law, but with the, uh, the overall atmosphere of the area, which is agriculture with uh, no developments in, uh, 
in or around that immediate area, while there's some developments to the south, there's no developments that use affluent uh, water aerobic treatment systems. Now, the other problem with the water aerobic treatment system is that the, the putt itself is next to the Mustang Creek tributary number one. Uh, according to the, uh, according to, to studies, you should not put an aerobic treatment system next to a protected stream or creek or river. Now, in this particular case, and Ms. Provine will be able to speak to that, speak to this in more detail, as she's an expert in floodplain and uh, other areas of concern regarding drainage, but if you put in an aerobic system next to a floodplain and next to a creek, you run the high risk that whenever that floods, because the aerobic system, what it does is that it takes the water into the tank and then it sprays it up into the air. Now, if that water cannot be sprayed into the air to be dispersed because it's flooded, it's going to pool and it's going to accumulate and it doesn't get dispersed like it's supposed to, like it's required to. The location of this proposed development is in a floodplain. They've not addressed nor done anything to consider our concerns of placing an aerobic treatment system in a floodplain and the effects that it would have on the neighbors. The neighbors that I have here with me, uh, particularly Vincent and Charla, uh, they are, um, yes, they use a water well. They have a water well. During the most recent floods, their well was contaminated from the water. They had to use uh, chemicals and other treatments to, in order to have pure and water that they could drink and use. In this particular case, there's no consideration as to those concerns or the effects that it would have on the neighbors in using the aerobic treatment system. So not only is, can they not use an aerobic treatment system based on the design statement that they submitted, as they do not have a near enough setback, even if they were allowed to use an aerobic treatment system, they do not consider the effects that it would have on the neighbors or in the area. And while they maintain and contend that it's too expensive to run a sewer, to the property, I've not heard any numbers as to what it would take to run the sewer. At the meeting, and I was only able to attend one meeting as I was only hired uh, shortly before this uh, previous meeting, there was no numbers discussed, the numbers were unknown. But if they're wanting to build in this backyard, and if they're wanting to change, wanting to use a system, they have to take into consideration these concerns. And with that, I'd like to have Teresa come up and well, to discuss. Wait, wait a minute. I'll, oh, I'm I'll sorry. call people up. And, and, I'm sorry. Uh, we want to see if there are any questions of you first. Commissioners? I want to ask Mark a question before we get the next protester. Uh, just a, a quick question about aerobic systems and the lot size they're supposed to be on. Tell me what you contemplate this aerobic system will function like. Okay. Um, the DEQ requirements with public water and uh, an aerobic system is a half acre. And DEQ has those requirements set for a reason. The, uh, but the address, to address the floodplain, uh, anywhere there's floodplain on the site, by city, by city regulations, you're required to build that lot or that house a foot above the floodplain, which would require us to fill those lots that have any floodplain on them. The, the 10 foot, so you have, if you have a 10 foot setback and a side yard of 10 foot, I'm still only allowed, we agreed to 35% coverage. So all that says is that I can put that house somewhere on that lot, but I can still only have 35% coverage with structures on that. So just allows me to move the, the house around within the lot so that his, his point with, I won't have room for the septic, I'm only covering 35% of the lot with structure, so I have room to put the aerobic system on the lot. Um, also, with the, uh, as, to address his question of the um, aerobic system within the vicinity of the water wells, DEQ has a requirement for that too. Um, DEQ won't allow you to build within 50 feet of a water well for that reason. We're not. We're, we're supplying water to us, and we'll be more than 50 feet from any of theirs. We've also agreed to provide them a water service. I understand if they don't want that, but it would alleviate any concern they have. Um, as far as aerobic versus lateral lines go, I talked to somebody that's, 
I would say, is more of an expert in the industry, you know, because they build them day in, day out, and that's Big Tobacco, that they do 90% aerobic in Oklahoma and 10% lateral. Why? Because majority of Oklahoma won't perk, so that's why they do that. The, um, they've also tried to say that, um, the, that the system requires maintenance. All lateral and aerobic systems require maintenance. The, um, they provide a two-year warranty on their installation of the aerobic systems, and they say that less than 2% fail within that two years without maintenance. That means they don't come back out and replace any parts to that aerobic system um, within their two-year maintenance agreement on less than 2% of their cases. And they said that they do about 25 installs per month, and maybe one water pump has to be repaired out of that. Um, the um, aerobic works better in a high water table because it's, a lateral line is not going to perk in a, flood, in, a, in a high water table. So to answer your question, any floodplain areas, we'll build up. I only have 35% coverage, so I'm going to have room to use that aerobic system, and we'll have to meet all DEQ requirements. Okay, Mark, you've, you lost me a little bit with your 35%. You've got a half-acre lot, and I'm rounding a little bit, but you've got slightly over 20,000 square feet for a half-acre lot. Okay? Yes. 35% of that, you're going to lose 7,000 of them, 7 plus. Now you've got 13,000 left to work that system. That counts knocking out your side yard and your backyard setbacks. And then what this gentleman just read to us about setback of 25 feet from any adjoining public street. So you've got to be off the street, public property. You're up against a, something else. And property of another homeowner. That's the next door neighbor. You can be, with, you can be within the setbacks with a, with a septic system, but not with a structure. I couldn't well, have a house within a setback. Reading what he handed out says the discharge, a minimum setback of 25 feet shall be maintained from a surface application area to the adjoining public street, public property, or property owned by another person. When I start carving up your lot, all of a sudden, I'm eating up a great deal of your remaining 13,000 feet. So your aerobic system is just a spray applicator, correct? Right. It's just a spray applicator. So you're gonna you're gonna apply that you're gonna apply that over the yard that you have left, and I believe you have plenty of yard on a half acre lot because DEQ requirements are that exactly that a half acre lot. Oklahoma City's requirement though is. What he handed us. No person shall spray wastewater effluent from an individual system, and then it talks about these setbacks. Are you not aware of this? I've never read those uh, regulations. I mean, I don't install the septic systems, and the the septic system contractor would have to adhere to their codes. Well, when I did the math applying this, I'm starting to run out of dirt on half acre, and that's been one of my concerns with what I call urban densities uh, without sewer. And this is a poster child for that, it appears to me. And where do I put my backyard amenities, like my swimming pool or my patios and so forth? If roof. On the roof. Uh, I mean, some places don't have that. I mean, some places don't have room for pools. I'm, I'm not saying that this doesn't. There's some lots that are larger than half acres. There's going to be some that, that are right on the half acre mark. But to address your question, the septic system contractor has to pull a permit, and he has to meet city regulations. DEQ's requirements is th for them to sign the plat as a half acre lot. Okay, we've talked about septic systems.
I'm not going to spell this right because I'm not sure I'm reading it correctly. Teresa Provine, is that correct? Um, you're the one who's written the extensive water yes, report? Yes, I did. I did and showed the floodplain and... Will you condense that for us, understanding that... I'm going that to try to. <laughs> yes. We are not uh, hydrologists or... Yes, I was a hydro I retired from the Bureau of Reclamation as a hydrologist. I worked for the Forest Service and Bureau of Reclamation. Um, I wrote numerous studies. I testified numerous times. Um, this piece of land is pro quite possibly the worst development for any kind of land for development I've ever seen. And I mean, the Bureau built dams. We built Thunderbird, Foss, McGee Creek. Um, we, bi we built dams all over Hoover Dam, the company, the agency I retired from. But this, literally, if you will go to, it's 4B of the, or 4A of the map. I mean, you can't make this stuff up right here is the floodplain. And DEQ, by the way, only says a half acre because it's in Oklahoma City. Everyone else has to build on one acre track of lands to put these, these type of septic systems. Edmond does that, Grady County does that, Cleveland County does that, everyone. Oklahoma City is the only city that surrounds that has a half acre lot. And the reason being, he may have talked to someone, but I went to experts at OSU who are world renowned, and these things are disasters. One in five fell. This is the floodplain for that 80 acres right here. As you can see, it takes up over 25 acres of land of the 80 acres. Okay, you can't put one of these septic systems in a floodplain. It's against law, you can't put one in because of the simple fact you put one in a floodplain, if you think about this, and you can't build up a floodplain either. All you can do is build up a pad for a house. You can't bring any more dirt in because of the erosion into the creek. And what has happened to this creek, because I, was, I guess I'm the only one who has walked it, looked at it, did measurements, did my own calculations on it. This floodplain has just gone to pieces since Bitter Creek Mustang was allowed to develop. The, flood, the flood, FEMA floodplain map that you look at, it's 4C, and it shows the elevations. It's right here. And as you can see, it pretty well mirrors the floodplain that we're looking at. And what has happened, and I walked this area last June, and I saw how high the waters got. And you can see that on 4B. And if you look at it, the floodplain has expanded almost a third more than what it was. Now, I'm in talks right now with FEMA to try to get them to rewalk it with me, which will drastically change their flood insurance rate map on this particular piece of property. Mustang developed. The homeowner who had this did not mitigate, did not come to Oklahoma City and, and try to get your help. They should have, you guys should have stepped in with this homeowner and help them against the development that that Mustang did. Because personally, they've rendered this 80 acres almost useless. I mean, there are some areas that you can develop, but this is, this is a, under your plan, Oklahoma City, this is a considered an environmentally sensitive area. So all the trees that surround this, and I'm telling you, this floodplain, there are just trees everywhere around it. You can't, cut one down, you can't put a detention pond in it. The court's not going to allow it. But they do have to put a deten detention pond in it somewhere because they have to mitigate the runoff of all these systems. So that takes away probably another 20 acres that they can't build on. I, I mean, this, this development and these septic systems are a nightmare. One, seriously, one in five fell. There's enough information on the internet that anyone could pull it up, but this guy from OSU, who is a world-renowned doctor, wrote a nice little article which I had included. I think you got a copy of it. Has more degrees than 
I would I have ever seen in my life has more experience is actually a hydrology engineer teaches hydrology is a doctor this is these are three of his rules do not allow children to play near these systems aerobic systems do not discharge treated affluents near a stream or creek do not allow animals to consume the water that is out of these systems my husband and I just for the heck of it went on a little tour of these systems and looked at only houses that had them do you know how they had them built they were built here here's your back porch here's the system right here guess where the sprinklers were right there as you stepped off the back porch I mean I was just in shock that that anyone would allow anything like this and they were all on one acre track of lands and they still had water standing the problem with them is they're expensive to maintain people have to put anywhere between three to five hundred dollars a year into this system it runs on electricity powers out and we go without power for days out there they don't work at all they just spray the influence out on the ground now what and the other part really is just that doesn't everyone have a neighbor who doesn't mow their lawn who doesn't care who has 10 cars out in front of their driveway well this is what's going to happen they're not going to maintain it because it's three to five hundred dollars a year to maintain it by the time you get around if you let it set you don't have it serviced every six months then you're spraying waste wastewater that gets into the groundwater that also gets into the creek like I said Oklahoma City should go with the rest of this with the state and most of the states if you look at this they don't even allow development in floodplain situations so I'm quoting I have several quotes from well, your, we're, we're okay kind of get the picture on yeah. septic okay. systems is okay. there something else well um, out of your OKC Council staff report, you state that in the event of future flooding of structures downstream, that homeowners can request an open record request of this basin and all knowledge of flooding in this basin. This basin has flooded. I mean, the road's been taken out, I don't know how many times. And most of these people, their water wells are in the 100-year floodplain now. From a 1992 uh, FEMA floodplain, my area where we live and the area across the street has doubled in size doubled in size of the floodplain and i can guarantee you it's now quite a bit larger and if i get fema to come do another floodplain study there'll be probably 30 acres left to develop on so i'm just saying these people downstream their wells are flooded now their septic system and everyone depends on these streams for water this is everybody's water supply. These creeks recharge our wells. And um, when you have these kind of septic systems, you put an enormous amount of nitrates in the water. State law, you just can't do this. I mean, this is, I've talked to DEQ, I've talked to the Water Board, I've been in contact with almost every agency, agency there is. The core, because this is a 404 core river, this can't be done. I mean, they're, they're simply not going to allow this to happen on this kind of creek area. Now, sure, you could put five acre homes on here. You could probably put two or three acre homes on here. But half acre homes are going to just simply destroy the system. And one more thing, the 320 acres that's directly west of this floodplain all drains into this creek those houses right now they're all rated one acre rural homes so you're going you're looking at 320 homes being built above this floodplain simply if <laughs> those houses won't be worth the money they're built on because they'll be flooded okay thank you thank you we do have a few more people to speak I'm going to ask, as I call your name, we're looking for additional information that we haven't heard. Steve Fishbeck. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. These were out of order. Michael Mayer. Give us your name and address, please. My name is Vincent Mayer. I live at 5401 South Morgan Road. Uh, if you look at the map right there where the RD is on Morgan Road, that house, that farm's mine, and my property backs up to the back of it. Those two creeks, there's two creeks that go through my place at the back side where this property is, and one through the middle, and then they join, could join farther down <clears throat> and become one. Just to give you an idea where I'm at. Okay. Uh, respected members of the Oklahoma City Planning Commission, my name is Vincent Mayer, and I represent my, my, myself, my wife, Sharla, and my uh, neighbors. We reside at 5401 South Morgan Road, which is in Oklahoma City and Canadian County. Our western property boundary and property line adhere to and cross over the creek, which is adjoined by 80 acres that has been requested by Grubbs Consulting to be rezoned from agricultural to PUD 1589. On August 24th, 2015, and again on September 8th, uh, we've had meetings with the, uh, the representatives or the actual engineer or end builder of uh, Gary Owens and then Grubbs Consulting and their legal representatives, David Box. Uh, they have met with many of the residents of the adjoining and adjacent properties. Several issues have been brought up for discussion with the applicant, and it became apparent that many of our concerns were not agreeable with Mr. Owens. I have three main issues that I have concerns with, and it's the drainage and the sewage, and uh, I'll address them here real quickly if I could. Regarding drainage issues and flooding problems associated with the two creeks that flow south to north through this section of land, we have been told that there will be no improvements done to the westernmost creek to assist with the drainage. These creeks converge just north of my property and flow to the corner of Southwest 44th Street and Morgan Road. Prior to their junction point, one creek runs through the middle of my land and the second one runs down the western border. Every time we have a flood, or we have had flood waters in the past five years where I've resided there, uh, we've had flooding issues. It's, uh, I've got some photographs I'll show you here in just a minute. Uh, our fences get washed out. We spend months removing debris, limbs and stumps, trees. It's, the flooding problems are washing out whole trees now. I've got just tree stumps in there as big around as five gallon buckets to trash cans. It just, it washes them completely out and it's creating a lot of work for us as well. Just because of, like she was saying, with like Bitter Creek and the Walmart and everything else is flooding these creeks out with all the asphalt and peaked roofs. <clears throat> During the storm season, we, there this pre blast storm season, we had the grass completely stripped off areas of our middle pasture by the water flow and the well that I have was contaminated also. Would it be all right if I bring these pictures up to show you, sir? Sure, start over here. Yes, sir. Pardon the crudity of these. I just printed them off my computer and I kind of wrote a little caption there for you to see what kind of we're dealing with. When those creeks converge. No, we, we, need, we need you to be at the microphone when you speak. Let me just give him all the, he'll pass them around. That's fine. Okay. Um, repairing our fences is non-insurable, and the money is out of pocket to us, as well as the equipment needed to remove the debris. I personally have had to repair my south fence on the Middle Creek three times so far, and I've, uh, I have to do it again this fall. Many of the posts were washed out this time. Uh, I have my old police horse in there, and I have my donkey in there, and I had to build a cross fence just to keep them out of that area until I can fix it. The fence that's adjacent to the property in question, my north fence is completely washed out in there and it's full of brush and limbs and everything else which is going to require more than I have as far as equipment to clean that out and repair that fence. This past spring, the bridge at Southwest 44th and Morgan Road was twice damaged and required several weeks to be repaired. There's two black and white photographs in there of that bridge where it was washed out. This not only impedes our city services and mail, but also emergency services, IMSA fire and police response to the area, which is inexcusable considering that many of my neighbors are senior citizens. During these storms, our area for the most part is inaccessible. We're basically high ground in the middle of a, of a, of a it's a low ground area, but we're a high, where my house is is high ground. And then it slopes off from there. 
So we're kind of our own little island whenever we get these storms in here. <clears throat> when I asked where the storm sewer water would be directed with regard to this PUD, I was advised that it will be channeled into the creek, evidently via collection pond, which is of no value to us once it's filled. And that won't take very long where we're living at. Please refer to page 7 of the Southwest Sector Plan Amendment to the Oklahoma City Plan 2010-2020. Development adjacent to a flood area will increase flooding downstream as grass and forested areas are replaced by paving and rooftops. This tends to increase the extent of the flood areas over time. Loss of grass and forested areas along a stream also reduces the natural filtering of the pollutants, thereby increasing stream contaminants. That's where the stumps and the trees come into play. In addition, these areas are prime wildlife habitat, which we have a very, very, it's, it's really neat out there where we're at. There's lots of animals and it's, it's a beautiful place. I hate to see it developed. For developments where de uh, detention is required, the amount of water flowing from the property after a storm is compared for post-development and pre-development conditions. The developer, developer is then required to construct a pond large enough to hold the projected increase in runoff, runoff and the water can be released after the storm is over. Often these ponds are incorporated into common areas and can serve as recreational resource. In some cases, detention is handled through regional off-site ponds rather than on-site detention. They did agree to put in a retention pond, but as I said, they have no concept of the amount of water that's going through there. I live there and I've seen it. There's not a pond big enough to handle what we're talking about here. That one flooded area down by my well house, that's just one creek, and it's flooded probably 60 to 75 feet across out of its banks every time. And that's the middle one. That's not even the one that's adjacent to that property. But when they back up at, that, at the bridge, they back up both of them to my place. <clears throat> The Southwest, okay, I just referred to that Southwest sector plan. Uh, Mr. Box told me, advised me that this particular plan was null and void. The drainage issues we face come, from, you know, and I, from what I understand, it's still in effect until it's replaced. The drainage issues we face come from development that has occurred upstream in the city of Mustang. I've said several times at these meetings that we already have flood issues with this 80 acres just being vacant farmland. These natural creeks are not capable of handling the volumes of water that are being forced through them by further development. Covering an adjoining area with more asphalt and huge peak roofs will only cause more destructive erosion issues to my land and my neighbor's properties, not to mention danger to my livestock and pollution to our shallow water wells that are drilled along these two creeks. Water out there is very difficult to find. That creek, even when it's dry, has a creek running underneath it, and that's where our water comes from. They're basically, from what I understand, quicksand wells. That's our water sources. They're talking about bringing a water line in and putting stems in there for the residents in there to, to use city water. That's not going to affect me on Morgan Road. I can't run a half a mile or a quarter mile of water line up to my house. It's going to cost me a bunch of money just to protect my family from sewage water going out into my well, into a creek or anything else. They're not going to put a, a line down Morgan Road. This is going to affect people on Pleasant Hill. The thought of my child drinking our water that is contaminated with antifreeze and motor oil, which has been washed off these streets in this proposed neighborhood, appalls me. In short, the builder will not improve drainage because it's apparently not required by the city. Regarding the installation of city sewer in place of the proposed aerobic sewer systems, this is another issue which will not be changed by Mr. Owens. I addressed it again at our meeting this two days ago, and it was still, there no, no change in that, the aerobic system. <clears throat> this is another, uh, excuse me. This issue will not be changed by Mr. Owen due, its, due to its being cross prohibitive. I also addressed how much it would cost to bring sewer system in, and that wasn't the, I can't get a figure on that either. I believe he said $400,000 to bring in the water, you know, which is the price of one or two of those homes that are, so let, you know, they're going to go in there. There's a fire hydrant at Southwest 59 at in Morgan Road, and I addressed the issue that they could use the Mustang water, and then they wouldn't have to have that cost with putting in the water line. 
Uh, as from what I understand, this is not allowed. Evidently, the revenue, uh, I can only assume the city of Oklahoma City wants the water revenue. This whole thing seems to be nothing but an issue of money and not doing what is right for the community, the environment, and the wildlife that will be affected if this PUD passes. I confirmed with the builder my understanding of how the anaerobic or aerobic sewage system functions, and he confirmed that I was correct in its operation. As a former machinist mate aboard nuclear submarines, I learned that the less moving parts, complex parts, and associated subsystems that make a system easier to maintain, make a system easier to maintain and operate. I used these skills at the Oklahoma City Zoo for two and a half years as a mechanic for the Aquaticus Dolphin and Sea Lion Marine Facility where I dealt with chlorination, purification, and wastewater disposal systems for marine mammals. I, for one, do not like a system that pumps so-called treated wastewater out onto the surface of the surrounding area that can flow or be washed into the above-listed creeks and contaminate our water wells. My well is my only source of water and it's only 80 feet deep. If approved, there will be over 100 homes pumping so-called treated human waste water out on the surrounding ground near the confirmed floodplain. I'm not willing to trust my health, my family and child's health, or my livestock's health to some new homeowner who may or may not be able to identify if there's an electrical, mechanical, or chemical treatment malfunction to his complex and automated system. Mr. Mayor, we're getting into what's going over and over the same information. So. Do you have something that's new? We've talked about aerobic systems, and we've talked about uh, drainage areas. I'm fixing to move on, sir. I'm sorry. It's at the bottom of my paragraph. I was going to try to address the issues that I've brought up myself personally. Okay. Um, lot size and homes being complementary to the surrounding area during the meeting, there were concerns regarding the size of the homes that were proposed. I read from the Southwest Sector Plan Amendment to the Oklahoma City Plan 2010-2020, which fortunately my wife Charlotte made a copy of a few days prior to it suddenly being removed from the online access. After reading page 23 regarding that in rural area approved rural residential development that provides for appropriate housing densities and lot sizes to conform to the prevailing pattern in adjacent developments. Mr. Box advised that our area was not considered rural and showed me the legend and diagram on the preceding page 22 that indicated so. Who made the decision that we were no longer rural? Uh, our only, you know, our whole section of land is predominantly farmland, complete with farm and, you know, gardens, livestock, and everything else. And all of a sudden, we're, we're considered to be a city, you know, a city development, and we're not. It's all rural. Our concern initially was akin to our situation to what happened in Westbury North with cheap siding covered houses in the late 90s. This addition to the neighborhood did nothing to accentuate the surrounding homes in the neighborhood, one of which was mined for over 18 years. The quick decline of the neighborhood during and after that time was one of the primary reasons I moved my family there from there five years ago. Mr. Owens says he will specify in the PUD that there would be one single family home per half acre with a minimum of 2,500 square feet, three car garage, and 70% 70, 70 brick construction. I asked why the lot size could not be increased to accentuate the surrounding homes already established in this community, much like the neighborhood he and his brother built known as Thoroughbred Acres. Thoroughbred Acres was built on acreage tracks with allocations for livestock. This was not agreeable to Mr. Owens, either which, as I understand it, once again, it's not economically feasible. I asked at our previous meeting several weeks ago, and again at this meeting, if Mr. Owens had actually purchased the 80 acres yet, and he says he has not. It has, however, been under contract pending this PUD application, I presume. During the meeting, Mr. Owens stated, and I quote, best case scenario right now, referring to us, referring to this development being our best case scenario, is how I interpreted it. Best case scenario right now, but if you wait, I guarantee you'll have 350 houses. And I may be the one to do that, whether it gets uh, zoned or not, end quote. I asked him if he was threatening us at this point. Evidently, Mr. Owens is going to attempt to do whatever he and his associates have to do to get their way, and we as citizens will have to pay for our failure to toe the line for him. Members of the Planning Commission, I'm not trying to stand in the way of progress. I'm not trying to stand in the way of a man making a living at his craft either. I ask only you consider the damage that will be done not only to my land, but to the land and property of my neighbors, to the water resources, to the livestock, 
and the many species of wildlife that reside here if this PUD is approved in its current form. I too am a public servant and I have been for 24 years of my life. My record is unblemished to my knowledge and since the day, day one I have always tried to do the right thing simply because it's the right thing to do. I've always held myself overly accountable knowing my actions affect a lot of people, good and bad. I ask only you take everything into consideration and put yourselves in our shoes. In my humble opinion, I feel this is more about economics and not a matter of what is best for this small piece of the city. Thank you, sir. John Graham. Mr. Graham, you have something new for us? Yes, the, uh, the Give former... Give your name and address, please. John Graham, 5600 South Pleasant Hill Road. Okay. Uh, yeah, the former letter I submitted was um, conditionally addressed the, the flooding, the drainage issues, the, the road issue, and the dissimilarity between housing sizes, lot sizes, and property values. That was submitted for the July meeting. Um, I, I, I thought that I'd probably have to resubmit a letter for the August meeting. I got called to a family funeral in Tennessee and was unable to attend that meeting. Um, I'd like to resend that letter. It may not be possible, but... Uh, resend it or rescind it? Well, no, just uh, cancel it. That's what rescind it. Yeah, That's I wrote fine. that for the July meeting and not for this meeting. Um, I would like to speak to something new that has not been addressed uh, by any of the members today, okay. uh, by the developer in his application, nor by the Planning Commission staff report. That's the fact that on this 80 acres, there exists an active oil and gas well. I am a petroleum engineer, work for the largest employer here in the city, and have 36 years of experience. The municipal code of the city of Oklahoma, at the time of wells drilled, and the Corporation Commission has granted a permit, requires a 300-foot um, offset if there's an existing home. The well can't be drilled within 300 feet of that. The inverse is true if there's construction at the time of that well permit. Now, actual offset or setback, whatever you call it, may be less than that, after an existing well has been built there. Uh, however, this well is not just a single well. Um, I mean, it is a single well, but it's, it's a large pad of about roughly, uh, just looking at aerial photography, maybe about three acres. The well is a active producing well operated by Lynn Operating Company. It's the Purcell 1-23D well. It is currently active. I've checked the Corporation Commission production records. The well is producing at paying quantities. And for the last two years, its production has been flat, uh, very little decline. Um, it is a directional well. It's a horizontal well that drills about a quarter mile to the uh, southeast underneath the Bitter Creek Mustang development. So the only access Lynn operating probably has underneath the city of Mustang in that subdivision is or in egress into their mineral rights that they've leased is by that well location. Should homes be built within the minimum spacing of that wellhead, um, they could not permit an additional well that would be less than 300 feet away from a home and drill additional directional wells to further develop their mineral uh, lease. The, the main issue, though, is not that. I realize the oil industry makes a living drilling wells. I do that. Um, the issue is more of a safety issue, in my opinion. Um, when, when a tank, this well is not only a well, but it's got a tank battery that contains hydrocarbon liquids as well. I spoke to um, the Corporation Commission field inspector for Canadian County, and he has personally seen lightning strikes hit tank batteries and debris blown as far as way as 300 yards away from a tank battery. So, um, you know, of course he cannot build on lots that are close or keep away from the wellhead as safety requires. Um, this well may have an economic life of 10, 20, 30 years, and so 
and it's right up in the front location near the entrance into this subdivision. So I think that's an, an issue that the Planning Commission and that this com the commissioners here should think about is the safety and welfare um, of citizens and the neighbors that would be purchasing land close to an active well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mark Grubbs again. I'll be real brief um, and try to just address a couple of things. As far as um, the detention, again, uh, we know of flooding issues in the area. Therefore, we plan to provide detention. Um, the lady is speaking, just saying that we can't do that in the creek. Um, I've done several projects in the city of Oklahoma City, and I've worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I've worked with the city of Oklahoma City on floodplain. We fill in the floodplain quite often for developments. We build ponds are mainly located in creeks um, any, of any sizable nature. Um, so you can work with the Army Corps of Engineers to do compensatory things such as build a pond for wildlife and things of that nature. So, um, and then again, just to touch base on the aerobic system, you have to meet DEQ standards. You have to meet the city of Oklahoma City standards in order to do that. They will be required to do so. You can't do it without meeting the governing standards. So I'll let Dennis wrap it up. Well, I'll echo one thing the protesters have said because I know something about aerobic systems, and they do require maintenance a couple of times a year, and it does cost four or five hundred dollars a year. And if they're not maintained, they do become a problem. And I frankly think Oklahoma City's requirement or allowance, I won't even call it a requirement, an allowance that you can do it on a half an acre is probably in an inadequate amount of space to do that in. We have the ordinance that we have, but uh, maybe we can look at changing that. Well, with regard to that, that ordinance, Mr. Chairman, I mean, we will comply with all the ordinance requirements. Of course, I, I know that. Yeah, you've, you've raised that issue. Mr. Gales raised the issue about spacing and, and whether we meet the codes. We'll meet all the codes. Um, as I go through the plethora of arguments against this project, um, it reminds me of a similar project I did for Mr. Owens about 25 years ago on Mustang Road. And the arguments in that case were very similar. And they boil down to, we, we don't want any more development. We've got our development. We don't want to see any kind of development coming, whether it was arguments like this about oil wells or creeks or whatever. The reason we have these regulations in place is to require us to comply with them so we can be a good neighbor. That's why Mr. Owens agreed to the one-acre uh, tracks on the east side of the creek. But when you look at your comprehensive plan that was just approved, we're in compliance with it. Uh, you're going to have higher density developments occurring out in this area. You already have RA property zoned back to the west, and so uh, we think we've done everything we could to compromise, and we would ask for your support. We can agree with TEs, and if you have any other questions, Mr. Grubbs or myself, we'd... You're actually under the old ordinance because of the time that this was filed. I understand. So things like the Southwest Sector Plan do apply in this instance. And the new comprehensive plan would apply, too, and the staff's already... Well, the staff has talked about higher density uh, developments. We're bringing a water line, so we think we're in conformance. Commissioners, discussion. Have enough information? <laughs> Certainly an abundance of information. I just am not comfortable with this development at all, and I'm, I'm concerned about my ability to articulate it very specifically. But it seems to me, I mean, the, the first thing that jumped out at this uh, to me was the idea of putting these half-acre tracks, you know, an RA. And that, I, I just don't think that that is a good fit for this area. I don't think it's uh, you know, that the die is cast, that this uh, area is all going to be, you know, higher density development. And I think it would be better if there were uh, full amenities to the area. I, I hear some 
uh, information that makes me question whether that's even possible given the, the issues with respect to flooding and so on. But um, I, I guess I'm just not there. I'm, I'm not ready to vote in favor of this. Anyone else comment? Nick? Well, Mr. Chairman, going back to a couple of things I said before, uh, boiling it down, I, I think there's two issues, maybe one issue with two parts. Uh, that's density. Uh, first part of that density is compatibility. Uh, I'm not so sure we're compatible with the surrounding area. Granted, to the south is Mustang, and it's a different deal. Uh, they have all services. Uh, we don't. Uh, the other is the, the aerobic systems on half acre. Uh, and this is just a technical thing, but you know, we we have before us a PUD application with a base underlying zoning of RA. And obviously our RA zoning is for more than half acres, but uh, in PUDs you can control your your lot size and density. So this one steps it down to a half acre, and it 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 just doesn't. I guess using Janice's word, just doesn't seem to fit. And uh, I'm I'm not having trouble bringing myself around to support it. Anyone else? I'm going to move for denial. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second for denial. Cast your votes. And it is denied. Item 15 is C6742, the preliminary plat of Traditions Business Center located west of Santa Fe and north of Northwest 150th. I'm here as the applicant, Neil McGee, with one of the partners in uh, Traditions Business Center. My address is 3006 Oakwood Drive, Edmond, Oklahoma. I just wanted to state that uh, I've read the staff recommendations after the uh, preliminary plat was submitted. We don't have any problems and feel we'll be in compliance with all their recommendations for the project for okay. to, to go to the final plat. No one signed up, commissioners? With approval. Do you agree with all of the TEs? You don't have any problems with it? Didn't say anything that stood out that'd be a problem. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 15. Cast your votes. Uh, we need a few more votes, folks. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Item 16 is ABC 844 for an ABC 2 overlay to the C3 district located at 11109 North May Avenue. You are? I'm John Lee, uh, 807 Wilmot Place, Edmond, Oklahoma, for the applicant Pink Parrot 2 LLC. Okay. I just, I didn't know if that was the, if that was part of my deal. I didn't want to get started without him. No? Okay. Go right ahead. We're okay. here. Um, I'm, I'm really only here to address what I understand is an 11th hour opposition. It came in the form of some sort of affidavit uh, from an officer of the Oklahoma City Police Department. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that may uh, come up about it. Well, there are obviously a number of concerns raised about uh, other establishments under the same control. Well, let me, if, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, before yeah. he gets off on that, uh, there are issues about other establishments. 
But the application before us is for this location, not for the other establishment. Uh, so I think we need to confine our or focus, if you will, on, on this this application. Uh, I do have some concerns about this application, but it, they're not necessarily related to what other locations under common ownership or management uh, may have some problems. So okay. uh, let's try to maintain our focus. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the the ABC2 overlay that, that we're seeking here today is for the lo uh, uh, location just north of Quail Creek Road on May Avenue. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. It used to be a taco, whoops, it used to be a taco cabana location uh, serving Mexican food and mixed drinks. This is essentially the same concept. This is not unique in the city and certainly not unique this location. Um, there were some uh, I, I appreciate what Mr. Gale said about the, the other issues, and I'm happy to address those, but um, there were some other uh, allegations, if you will, in the opposition affidavit related to this location and what we're trying to accomplish here. This is a 3,200 square foot uh, restaurant. It's a restaurant. It serves mixed drinks. Uh, it's open late, but it is a restaurant. Um, it has a, I, I believe in your application uh, uh, or one of these documents, I believe everybody has a copy of the uh, menu or the proposed menu Yes. Uh, for the uh, site. It is kid friendly, it's open for lunch, um, and, and we are looking to uh, expand our business beyond the uh, business that is uniquely Bricktown, i.e nightclubs and bars and things like that. Uh, that is a situation that is unique to Bricktown and a few other pockets, but especially Bricktown. And this is not, this is not the same thing. It's a different part of town. It's a different concept. And uh, the, as Mr. Gales pointed out, the, the issues with the other nightclubs are, are unique to those, to those uh, situations. As it relates to this particular place, the uh, affidavit uh, raises a, a, a couple of, of issues um, which, which need to be addressed. Um, to the extent that the affidavit relates to the uh, enterprise at this location and not to Mr. Uh, Rogers or to his other uh, uh, locations, uh, the implication to be drawn from the opposition affidavit is that it is possible that if you give Mr. Rogers a Type 2 overlay for this location, he could run, it, it, it's possible that he could run some sort of 24-hour, never closes down, serves food sometimes, then serves nothing but booze, and then after hours, it's just a party all night. That's the implication from the opposition. And there's nothing, there's nothing in the record to indicate anything like this. As a matter of fact, everything that's of record with this application indicates exactly the opposite. It's a restaurant, it's kid friendly, they want to serve food, primarily food and drinks to those people who are old enough to drink. The primary support for the opposition is the, and, and I, I'd ask for a little bit of, of leniency here. Um, we only received the opposition day before yesterday, so we haven't had a lot of time to gather things up and, and, and deal with it. But I have for the commission's review a, 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 a packet here. Did I blow it completely apart, Jeff? Yeah. Is that it? one set of color pho photographs, but they needed to be colored so Xerox wasn't going to work. Oh, I do have another set. 
I do have another set. Well, you can start on the other side with the Absolutely. other set then. Absolutely. I, I am short, so I'll, I'll work it from the sides. The, and, and I know this is, is working around, but, but I want to I want to keep a pace if I could. Go ahead. Um, the the support for the opposition is essentially that a member of the police department went out and looked at the facility, and based on some factors that he considered relevant, he determined that this could be in fact a nightclub and not a restaurant, and. Primary among those were the existence of a large central bar, the existence of what they call a, a grand room, which I, I took to mean just a large open area with seating around the edges, uh, the existence of beer logo signs, the existence of large screen TVs, and the existence of audio and video equipment in the facility. Now. What, what you'll see when you do get to these pictures is, oh, and, and the other thing was that as of, as of today, there is not a complete kitchen in the facility. And so what you'll see in this packet here is first a series of photographs as, of the kitchen at this facility as we sit here today. Now this facility's under construction, we're going through permitting, we're, we're dealing with that as it, as it comes along. But, that's where it sits. So you can see the um, vent hoods and the walk-in freezers and coolers and all of that, all for food prep, the closet, all of that kind of stuff. And if you look at the very back of the packet, what you will find is the invoice, which Mr. Rogers hasn't paid yet, but shortly will be, I'm sure, for nearly $13,000 in kitchen equipment. Now, the, again, the position taken in the opposition affidavit is that the existence of the large screen TVs, the beer logo signs, the central bar area, and the grand room setup of the plan indicate to this particular opponent that uh, this is, in fact, a nightclub, I, I think is his position, or a bar. So, if I could, uh, if you've already passed it along, fine, but what, what I will tell tell the members of the commission is this. The second set of photographs are of Toby Keith's I Love This Bar and Grill in Bricktown. This is a four million dollar a year restaurant and I think if you look at the second picture on the page what you'll find is a giant neon beer logo sign, multiple large screen TVs over a huge bar area. I think you would find the same true for the Twin Peaks location that is offered. <clears throat> you would sign, find the same thing to be true for both Louis locations, both Louis North and Louis South, as well as the Hooters locations. And like I said, we've only had about 36 hours. This is a restaurant. These are all clearly restaurants. The fact that they are going to have beer logo signs, large screen TVs, and speakers inside doesn't indicate anything other than somebody likes to watch football and has a beer, likes to have a beer when they do it. And that's exactly what we're looking for in, in the way of support from uh, this commission. So that's, that's one of the, the items that, that has to be... Uh, let, let me stop and ask you a question. Absolutely, please. Because I'm please. looking at the pictures and I'm looking down here at what's on the screen above my head. Mm -hmm. And the outer perimeter toward May Avenue, that's like outside patio or not? Yes, sir. Is that not, isn't that an outside patio? With the table, with the four tops around it? Yes. Okay. Next question. The next semicircle, it looks like a horseshoe inside, is the interior of the building. That's correct. And that's where, in the photograph, I saw a bench. All the way around, is that correct? Yes, if, if you, if in the photograph what you're seeing is the woodwork, the incomplete woodwork that will form the basis for the bench side of the booths that go around the outside of the restaurant. Okay, so you're anticipating that what we're looking at here is booths around that 
Well, I, I think what they've done, and, and Jeff can probably speak better to this, but I think what they've done is rather than create booths this way, they have turned it, and so you have a half booth, half chair set up, so you have tables all the way around the outside. Is that accurate? Okay. okay. That's, that's fine. Okay. That's one of the issues that he, he raised that sure. you didn't get to, but I saw in the picture. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think it's important that the commission understand that, that this is not something that is unique. It's not something that's special. It's not a new concept, although I wish I could say we'd come up with this. We, we have. Um, <clears throat> I knocked you off your game, didn't I? Well, it's not that you knocked me off my game. Mr. Gales actually, actually knocked me off my game when he told me not to worry about the, the, other, the other facility. So that, 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 and that's great. That's great. Um, at least so far. Um, if I could. Please. I, I mean, I don't want to interrupt the presentation, so, but maybe we could get to the issue, right? Which is, do we want an ABC at this location? Period. The end. You may guys won't be here in another 10 years operating this place. No offense, but that's generally the history of how these things go. So for us as commissioners, do we want an ABC2 at this location? And I, I guess I would like to, as an addendum to that question, ask um, for a little bit of input from legal counsel. Um, you know, we, we're in a peculiar situation with respect to um, the way we deal with ABC uh, in this city being as that it is a zoning, a land use decision. And, you know, if you look at the question purely as, uh, you know, whether ABC2 is an appropriate use at this location, um, then, you know, that's sort of one way to look at it. Um, on the other hand, every zoning application has an applicant. And I think, you know, the question that I have um, in my mind, especially given the very clear opposition to this application um, from the police department, is whether and to what extent uh, the question of the applicant uh, is permitted uh, to enter into our deliberations. I, th I think we're not zoning the person. I don't think that you can really consider the applicant. Now, you could, I think, that we have had some situations where if you have an area that has a lot of bars and somebody comes in with a new one, and that may play some type of an effect on whether or not, you know, saturation of bars would be detrimental. So I think that would be relevant. Um, but the way the operation is, I don't think is relevant. I think we need to look to see, unless, like I said, there's something about operating a particular bar with, you know, if it's compatible with this neighborhood, I think those are the issues we need to stick to, or the land use issues. So what I hear you saying then is that, that Michael's framing of the question is accurate. What we're here to decide today is whether this particular location is an appropriate location for an ABC2 use, period. Well, not only that, Janice, I, I, I agree with what Susan said, and in essence what I said before. But now that we're getting into the crux of this application the difficulty I'm having with this application I went by and I visited with the uh, manager uh, I think I have a, a feel for it and what we'll, what we have here is May Avenue backing up to Quail Creek we had a taco place in there and for you guys that were around when we did the taco place, we were very concerned at the time about the taco place being able to sell beer with their with their tacos. And we eh, did, didn't like it. Uh, we we went with that, uh, and one of the reasons we went with it is they were limiting their hours of operation, uh, not because of that application, but just. Their, their business model was what it was, and there was no late activity. Uh, 
here we have a, a, a full-blown restaurant. Uh, if you go that way, we have a club if you go the other way, but I'm going to stick with the, with the application in the, in the restaurants. We have a full-blown restaurant, and the, what the applicant just cited, you know, he showed us some pictures, showed us Toby Keith's. Well, where's Toby Keith's? In Bricktown in an entertainment district, high volume restaurant, very appropriate. Louis, high volume, good restaurant, not backed up to a neighborhood. The others he cited down Memorial Road, basically same thing. The problem I have here is a full blown restaurant operating late at night or into the late night hours. Uh, backing up to a, a neighborhood, and because of that, I have I have trouble with this this application. Uh, it's not because what it might be. Yeah, it could, and if it's certainly, if you take it to that level, which would make this an ABC three application, I, I certainly don't believe that's appropriate either. But I, I have concerns at the ABC two level. If we keep it right here at ABC two, uh, I I have concerns with with a full blown high volume restaurant there. Which by the way goes to the land use. Pardon? Which goes to the use of the land at this particular well, location. Sure. Yeah. If, if, yeah. I, if I may And that's the question. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Um, if I make a couple may make a couple of uh, observations both as to what Mr. Gales and what Mr. Hensley said. Um, as it turns out, I, I know that, that uh, Ms. Gales has been out to the site. I know that the opponent's been out to the site. Also somebody that's been out to the site um, is Brian Ferguson. And Brian Ferguson, he's not here today, unfortunately. But he is the, he did? Oh, OK, he just called you. I'm sorry, he hasn't been out. He just called. But Mr. Ferguson is the head of the Homeowners Association for Quail Creek. and. Um, I think that roundly, Mr. Ferguson was looking forward to having a restaurant like the one that's been proposed, um, and certainly has not entered any opposition, both either on his own behalf or on behalf of the HOA as a whole. And I, and I think that speaks volumes for the Quail Creek issue. The second thing that should be noted is that this particular piece of property butts up uh, on the, what is that, that would be the west side? West side is is buttressed by a storage facility, so there there is some, there is it, it's not backing up directly to Quail Creek, and I th I think that's important to to observe that there is a buffer created by that storage facility. I just have a couple of comments. Um, the first one is. I'm really surprised that the Taco Cabana did not have some type of ABC. I've never been to a Taco Cabana that didn't serve beer in a cooler right by where you ordered. So that may be a question of staff, or maybe Nick, you could answer that that was, but typically that's something that you can purchase at the counter. Um, I'll say speaking from experience, past. Um, the <laughs> second thing um, is that, I, because I don't know any history it's difficult for me to weigh this based on th something that I have no personal knowledge of, uh, the applicant, uh, the council. I, I will say it's kind of ironic and maybe even hypocritical because we do have applicants that come in here and we make comments around this horseshoe about how good of a corporate citizen they are. and. We you know, acknowledge that, and we say it from this horseshoe. Um, and I think, I can't sp speak for everybody, but I think sometimes we, that weighs into our decision on how, whether it's green or red. And so for me, that doesn't play into this. I don't know you, I don't know that you're, you're applicant. And so all I know is what I am reading right here in front of me. And the, the, the final note is, the staff's findings, which say this site is well separated from a residential development, uh, as is the dugout, which is right next door. 
few hundred yards away, maybe not even. Um, again, another establishment which I've heard of. Um, and so that's just saying there are, I, I just, for me, because I don't have a, a past at all with, to pull from, my basis would be just on what this application is, as Nick had said, and that's what I would admonish us all to, you know, base our recommendation and considerations on. Let me, let me enlighten you a little bit about the dugout and its history and its predecessor, <laughs> which, uh, which got the, or its predecessor actually got the first or original ABC. Uh, part of the rationale and, and justification for that, if you want to use that, is it is offset quote from Quail Creek because it's on the south side of Quail Creek Road and down by the commercial district. Uh, the other thing about uh, the area and Quail Creek and for that matter Stone Gate and Camelot, the other two neighborhoods, is if you'll recall we just had a club application not long ago for North Park Mall that we approved because of it was set up in such a way that uh, that it worked. And that may be a, a suggestion I have for you guys. Rather than bringing this to us in a straight ABC2 overlay, if you went back and put it in a SPUD application with an ABC2 in it, you could put some controls that are bothering me. I don't know if they're bothering some of the other commissioners, but you could put issues in about how you're going to control lighting, how you're going to control hours, what hours you're going to have, and things like that. Under straight ABC, uh, you know, you can keep it open and run it till 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't think you're going to be selling a whole lot of, lot of food. Uh, so, uh, I've heard. I've heard. I wouldn't know. I, I've heard. As, as, <laughs> as Todd had said, uh, I, I've heard. Uh, that may be a win-win a, a deal, uh, but I'm really concerned with a, just a wide-open, full restaurant right there. Uh, that's, you know, you, there is a buffer. The buffer he's referring to the storage facility is the old health club used to be there. It's now gone, uh, but we we have our residential stuff right to the north of it, and this keeps going down. This is the last thing, if you will, it's going north on May, getting farther away from the intersection of, of Hefner, and I just have some concern. And if it, you could abate some of those concerns in an SPUD, if you... I just have to say this. I have to step to a phone call. I have to leave right now so if we're gonna I can stay if we're gonna vote if you're gonna continue I just want to know just uh, I don't want to cut off debate if you guys want to keep going I'm just letting the applicant know no. I'm not going to be here for the vote so <laughs> question would be then whether the applicant is is willing to take a step back put the application into an SPD uh, and provide some of the uh, controls that would make um, perhaps some of the commissioners a little more comfortable. Was Taco Cabana? Well, they're, they're just discussing the way and the pros and cons right quickly. I, the only reason I didn't bring up the Taco Cabana thing as uh, Mr. Eilers did is because we asked for the uh, uh, previous alcohol and beverage information on that location and it can't be located but it was an all hours till 2 a.m. restaurant and it was a beer and alcohol restaurant I mean it, it, this, this location has been used in that way before with beer with alcohol and with those late hours 2 a.m. that wasn't the way Taco Cabana operated though I don't think it was not. Uh, yeah. Again, their their their, their business, business model is different. Their business model was different. Yeah, they, and that's one of the quirks of our 
ABC laws, it goes to 2 o'clock. Well, that's bothersome in some locations. Uh, we can't dictate that in an ABC application. You can set that out in an SPUD application. That, that's the, the difference. Could I have one second? You may. <laughs> Mike, bouncing in your chair, Mike. Well, they've always served beer. ABC one for beer. It's, it's expired. While you're discussing that, there's one other consideration. Of the time. If you don't in use light of Mr. Months, Hensley's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. In light of Mr. Hensley's, I'm trying to keep problem. him in the room and answer these. Uh, no, questions. I understand, and, and I'm going to I'm going to come up with another option here. What you could do is continue this for two weeks, and have your discussion, and do some figuring out what you want to do, uh, and then come back and have it heard in this form again, or come back and say we're going to do the SPUD request. That's, I was just going to say, were we going to have a full panel? Well, that's no guarantee. And they're going to go our way, too, right? So. <laughs> I'm walking out. So. Do you want to you take a vote or do you want to continue it? Okay. My client would like to pass it to the next docket. Uh, move to continue to September 24th. How's that? Or is that just to well, that's, well the, that, that's the whole that's the whole reason is that he wants time to decide whether or not he it's not to fair to have him sit here yeah. and oh I understand decide on the spot that's okay all right how long a month um, two weeks he two wants weeks. two weeks two weeks okay second meeting, meeting in September meeting. thank you cast your votes you're continued for two weeks we'll see you then thank you very much for your time Unless, of course, you decide to do an SPUD, in which case we'll see you when that comes back. Oh. Your um, option. Either way, we're looking forward to it, Mr. Mission. Your option. Okay. Item 17 is SPUD 849 to rezone 13 236 Northeastern Avenue from R1 Single Family District to SPUD 849. My name is Charles Allen, Allen Engineering. Uh, Mike Wimmer is here uh, with Wimmer Studios. He's the uh, potential uh, owner of the property. Uh, this is a, him and his wife are both uh, artists. They would like to build a, a home and also have a home studio and gallery for, uh, for their students and for displaying their art. Uh, I, I think this is, I worked on the, offices to the north there uh, so I'm pretty familiar with this area and the uh, Reveille Road and the owners the homeowners to the east of us uh, I think staff is wanting us to continue this I, I didn't want to continue this they're trying to close on this September 28th and they're going through their due diligence process uh, so we didn't want to re redesign it either because we've got the parking lot along Eastern Avenue trying to keep the house as far away from Eastern Avenue. Uh, I think the uh, Steve uh, Fisbeck is here also to speak. He's the homeowner to the east that would rather not see the house or the parking lot on the east side of the house. Uh, happy to answer any questions. We All right, Charles, let's back up. Okay. The history. Uh, you have a history with the property to the north. Correct. As you'll recall that was rather a protracted deal to get that all worked out. Correct. All the concerns from that property apply to this one. Correct. So have you, in this application, have you addressed all that and, and mitigated all that to the extent you can? I believe we have. I mean, this is, this is not just simply an office. This is a residence I, I, that has I'm a home thinking. office. It's a 4,600 4, square foot off home office with 1,400 square feet of studio. It's, it's an art gallery. Thank you. I, mean. I have um, some questions. Um, are, are there, is this going to be uh, a school? Are you going to be teaching? Um, 
students or what what is the school part of this application it's, look it's like? both probably two days a week i'm not sure which days there'll be approximately a dozen students throughout the day a six to eight hour period of two days a week coming to this learn about art there'll be occasionally an art gallery a showing uh, at the house mike wimmer can probably answer what kind of questions better parking will be provided for this site i think we have seven parking places one handicapped place i'm sorry ten ten, ten? total ten total yes okay okay and there's there's ex actually there's probably more there's it's a two car garage two car garage we don't we're not showing any parking spaces in front of the garage so we really probably have another room for another three places there okay you threw me off a little bit charles under other considerations it talks about um parking being located behind the building so that it's located away from northeastern um and you're saying they don't want to do that no we want the parking on the eastern avenue side behind there's an existing hedge hedge row there which you, we've actually moved the parking another we're not on the building setback line of 25 feet we're another 10 to 15 feet further back to maintain that that hedge row through there i think uh, it should have a couple of elevations that show what what it's look, going to look like from eastern avenue and from reveille road how much of that hedge row goes away if you cut a curb cut into eastern you're anticipating coming in off of eastern yes i think well i mean it's a 24 foot drive with 15 foot returns or 10 foot returns so uh, it's going to be 24 feet through the hedge there i think if we can show the elevation you'll see they've done a nice job to show how that's going to look from eastern avenue they've even added in a fire hydrant there which isn't there yet now will your drive meet the separation requirements required along eastern right now we have 150 feet from Reveille road to the drive and you need two 200 yeah well yeah. i think that's the other concern is the driveway separations what about going in off of Reveille? uh in the past that's always been a problem uh, i think steve's here that, that doesn't have a concern for the residents to use it but to have additional traffic for the commercial side of it is, is opposed which is ironic because this property actually the north 40 feet of this property is owned would be owned by the Wimmers, but that's where Reveille Road is, which is a private drive. Okay, we do have someone signed up. Mr. Fisbeck. Now it's your turn. If you'd give us your name and address, please. Now my name is Steve Fisbeck. I live at 2000 Reveille my home is uh just east of this property we will have a common property line but i finally got my hands on all the work report and paperwork yesterday and that was the first time i really had a chance to look at anything i knew there were plans being made and when i was looking at it it showed the parking lot between the house and eastern for the studio but then this uh, staff report wanted the parking lot moved behind the house, which would put it between their house and my house, and I, I don't really understand that. I don't, I don't see why I want a parking lot in my front of my house. You, you probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean the property you were talking about on the north uh, east corner it was stipulated you know that all the traffic would come in off of eastern and not reveille road if you've never been on reveille road it it shouldn't be reveille road it should be reveille lane right it's, we two, understand two cars have trouble going by one another yeah but that that's i have no problem with the residents going in i have no problem with the art studio i don't really know what their hours are going to be or anything like that my concern is the parking lot between my house and their house. I prefer the parking lot to be directly off of Eastern. We're confident he won't be open till 2 a.m. 
More discussion, commissioners? Any questions of Mr. Fesbeck? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, I really am struggling with the difficulty knowing that um, this area uh, and with Easton being the arterial street that it is, there's about eight stops between the Kilpatrick Turnpike and up to this point. There's about, there, there are several driveways, and then you've got all of these um, uh, streets into the neighborhood, Oaks Way, Deep Creek, um, and none of them, um, what, what, what do you call it, line up, you know, across from one another. So they're all kind of turning, you know, it, it, at, at different, you know, and it would just, it would, it would just seem to me to make more sense that if, if in fact the parking lot is going to be uh, either north of the property or which would be on the side of the property or to the back, that Reveille would become a better option for that traffic rather than coming out on Eastern. And I know in the evening time during rush hour that the traffic is backed up all the way uh, uh, up past this point. So, you know, coming off of Eastern, and I know the garage is, is I, I think the access to the, to, to the garage is uh, on the Eastern side, isn't it? Correct. I don't know that, I mean, sight distance isn't a problem here. Uh, you know, the staggering of the roads, I mean, that's very typical uh, to avoid the four-way. The conflicting left turns and actually causing accidents, that's why the drives are staggered. So, uh, But what makes this kind of unique is that there's about eight, you know, access points up and down uh, this road just getting, just getting there that, that makes it right. You know, which which makes it unique. I mean, it's not it's not unique in the uh, having the staggered right. access, but this you know, be, all of the access I roads. Think this would only to be, be the, the third drive. Yeah, drives and and entry into the neighborhood coming off Kilpatrick, entering right. Kilpatrick. You know. And then you have two existing drives, and then Reveille. You have 131st, two drives, and then Reveille currently. This would just be basically a third residential drive. For those, two, for those two houses that are correct um, directly south. Correct. Actually, I, I'm not even sure the, the one up 131st comes out onto Eastern Avenue. The house directly south, their, their driveway is right on our south property line. Actually, part of their driveway is our south property line. So then you'll use their driveway? No, no, we're going to oh, put okay. another drive. About It's about 100 feet north of that. The house south of that one, though, takes its access off 131st. Off 131st. Right. Yeah. So there would only be two drives between 131st and Reveille Road. Yeah, counting yours. Correct. Yours would make the third, right? No, his no, would be the second. second. There's only one there now for the house directly south. This property used to all be one property with the house to the south. There was a deed approval yeah. a couple of years ago splitting this property. Let's go up here. Yeah, but, it, but, it, well, but he, comes, he comes off of this street. from he doesn't act this. He doesn't oh, do that. Okay. So you, this guy does. This guy will. Then you have Reveille. Commissioners? Well, 
while you're thinking, when you sing happy birthday to Buck, it's his birthday today. No one else has signed up. I, I yeah, I, I can't, I can't support this. Um, just in the way that it is, I think it needs to be worked out with staff and, you know, uh, think about how we can better work on this design. Um, oh, by the way, I do have a question uh, for your classes. Are there art shows and other things that will go late into the night? No, my name is Mike Wimmer. No, I'm the chair of the art department at Oklahoma City University. My wife's the AP art teacher at Edmund Memorial. We, I'm a professional artist who've been uh, represented out of Oklahoma with a national following for over 35 years. I uh, moved to Edmond two years ago when my wife took the job at Edmond Memorial. We are planning on doing nothing more than what we've already done, which is teach a few private students. When we say 12 to 20, that's usually two, uh, twice a week. Most of those would be homeschool students during the daytime and a few, uh, I guess, uh, hobbyist or wanting professionals uh, in the evenings. And that's probably about it. My studio space right now already takes up 1,400 square feet at the home I'm in now. It's just not laid out in a way that we can utilize it very well. That's all it really comes down to. And as far as uh, having art shows or would-be art shows occasionally, you got students, you want to show their art. Once or twice a year, you're going to have a party. It would go where we have kids. We want to be in bed by 8 or 9 o'clock usually anyway. That's just who we are. We're both working professionals. We want to be good uh, citizens and, and neighbors at the same time to our uh, neighbors. That's why we wanted to take it off Reveille and make as much of private space towards the east of the living quarters as possible and be a nice sound buffer for ourselves and the sound traffic and for our neighbors to our east and to the south. Uh, we, we at first thought of coming off Reveille, but we understand it is so narrow and the road itself is very... Uh, Tired is probably a good way of describing it. And we did not want to put any extra wear and tear on the road at all if possible. And we are more than willing to do what we need to as far as adding the uh, water hydrant, uh, doing anything else we need to as far as we want to also, for our own privacy and for the privacy of our neighbors, also maintain the green fence that has been there and is there now. It's a well-established, very large green fence and use that as also a privacy fence for ourselves and as a sound barrier for traffic at the same time. We just need access for 10 to 20 students at a time. So whenever we have a, either large art classes, and most of those would be during the day for homeschool students. That's probably what you would see the largest traffic of, other than my own clients, which are coming in one or two at a time. Is that it? I'm sorry, do I have any more questions? Thanks, sir. If, if I might ask, is it, is it just the access that we have a, I mean, if that's something we could work out through the traffic department? I mean, this is, or is it the land use that you're not? Well, each, everybody has their own opinion, I guess. Sure. Uh, I've been down Reveille Road, and oh, I think your eastern access is probably superior to that. Oh. Uh, that said, I'm empathetic to uh, the gentleman who spoke. Uh, I understand why staff might want to slide things away from Eastern uh, right there with well, everything else up there. Uh, I think I would prefer to leave it on Eastern with an Eastern access. That is an editorial comment on my part. Um, Commissioner Cooper and I talked about this a little bit earlier, and, and I, I I think I'm going to have to agree with you about this, Nick. I had sort of forgotten about Reveille Road, um, about that history with respect to it and um, keeping traffic off of it. Um, that was something that was, you know, a, a long discussion uh, with respect to the applications on the north side. I had kind of forgotten about that. Um, I think in, in, in this case it may really be better to take the access off of East. Um, of course, if, if I were living next door, I would also prefer to have the parking as far away from me as I could get it. I think maybe we'll have to rely upon the, the hedge to do its 
uh, job and, and um, provide that buffer. I, I, I was not here to, to before, you know, with the previous discussion um, that uh, I know it's an office complex or something that's just uh, north of that. Um, so, you know, I don't really know all of the history as it relates to, to Reveille Road. Uh, just, you know, I just know it's not, um, we want to use it as a private drive, you know, almost, but, you know, that, that may not always be the case, uh, particularly with the development uh, that has come to both sides of the street on that particular corner. So uh, I, as Commissioner Gales, I have not uh, had the, the privilege of going down Reveille Road, but I might need to try going down Reveille Road uh, for uh, access. Um, so um, I believe that, that uh, that this 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 is not the optimum uh, to to approve, but I'm going to move for adoption. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve item 17. Cast your votes, and it's approved. Thank you. The rest of the items on the agenda have either been withdrawn or continued. Okay, planning commission members, anything? We had a great study session today. And so we understand. <laughs> and I think we'll probably revisit some of those issues. Development services? Planning department? Alfred Hitchcock said movies should uh, be no longer than the human bladder can accommodate. I'm thinking that ought to be for planning commission meetings as well. Municipal Counselor's Office, motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.